Gender-based violence is a global phenomenon and a violation of the human rights of women, girls, and other people negatively targeted because of their gender identity or gender expression. The harms can be physical, sexual, or psychological. As our online and offline lives become more integrated, gender-based violence and its impacts now overlap in both physical and digital spaces. Perpetrators of intimate partner violence, stalking, and sexual harassment are now using digital tools such as social media and GPS tracking to cause harm alongside in-person violence. Digital tools have also opened the door to new forms of abuse, such as the non-consensual creation of sexual images through artificial intelligence, including deepfake videos. The result of these new digitally enabled abusive behaviors is what's known as online gender-based violence. This is not a standalone form of violence, but a digitally enhanced form of existing violence. While recognizing that online gender-based violence is a part of the continuum of gender-based violence, there are some factors that make this form of violence especially challenging to address. First, since it occurs digitally, Online gender-based violence can happen across geographic locations, with abusers being able to access their targets even when they're not physically close to them. Second, because our lives are so digitally integrated, it can be nearly impossible for those targeted by this abuse to escape online gender-based violence. Additionally, many forms of online gender-based violence are not well understood either by the wider public or the justice system. Online gender-based violence has been minimized and ignored because of the mistaken belief that online abuse is not as harmful as abuse that happens in the physical world. As the rates of online gender-based violence continue to grow, there is a need to invest both time and resources into finding solutions to ending this violence. This requires a multifaceted approach, with governments, civil society organizations, and technology companies working to address these issues. Ultimately, all people globally have a role to play. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for a discussion on non-consensual intimate image distribution, the growing form of online gender-based violence online. My name is Kaylee Hiltz, and I'm a research associate at the Center for International Governance Innovation, a public policy research institute often referred to as a think tank based in Waterloo, Ontario. Today's event is part of a two-year research project in partnership with the International Development Research Center and IPSOS called Supporting a Safer Internet Globalist Survey of Gender-Based Violence Online. The discussion will be framed around the second paper in the series called Non-Consensual Intimate Image Distribution, the Legal Landscape in Kenya, Chile, and South Africa. The panelists will address the impacts this form of violence can have on victims, while also providing an overview of the regulatory models that exist and where improved solutions are needed. It is in that context that I'm delighted to introduce today's moderator, Ruhia Seward. Ruhia is a senior program officer at Canada's International Development Research Centre and is based in the Middle East Regional Office in Amman, Jordan. Ruhia supports a portfolio of research on the governance of digital technologies and the Global South, with a particular focus on gender equality and feminist issues online. As a procedural matter, this event will be recorded and posted on CG Online for future viewing and sharing. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions at any point throughout the discussion. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. Thank you and over to you, Rahia. Thank you. Welcome everyone, and thanks to CG for organizing this important discussion and for bringing together this excellent panel of researchers who are trying to help us unpack the legal and political and social landscape of the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. With us here today, I have Grace Mutungu, a research fellow at the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law at Strathmore University in Kenya. I have Michelle Bordichar, a public policy analyst at Derechos Digitales in Chile. And I have Nonklankla Chansa, a parliamentary liaison officer at the Law School of South Africa. Welcome, colleagues, and thanks for being here. So I'm going to just dive straight into this troubling subject. Um, but first, I really want to clarify the framing and definition of the subject. Because I think that it's a common way that we hear this is the term revenge porn. So tell me why this is a problematic framing. I'm going to turn to Nonklankla, please. 
thank you, Ruhia, for asking that very important question. I think the, the most important thing to, to state is that how we name and frame issues is very important. The words we use matter, language matter, it creates meaning. And most of the words that we use, they shape policy interventions, the public discourse and public attitudes. It is therefore important that we use appropriate terminology and the kind of language that creates a shift in how society perceives and discusses these kinds of issues. There are a lot of misconceptions out there and and most of them, they really, they come with the continued use of the media generated term, the friendly term, revenge porn. That, that term is very misleading and it is problematic for a number of reasons. Number one, revenge is not always the, the motivating factor for the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. The act is not always carried out by ex-partners for revengeful purposes. There are other actors that are involved. Calling this conduct revenge porn ignores the many devious ways in which these images are used. And based on the available research, we now know that some of these images are used as tools of harassment to commit gender-based violence for monetary compensation and for entertainment. And we have been told that this whole thing is big business. Secondly, the, using the term revenge porn feeds into the victim blaming narrative. It creates the impression that there's something wrong that a victim did. But we know that there are a number of ways in which these images can be obtained. Sometimes they are stolen through hacking. Sometimes they are taken through hidden cameras. There, there, are, there are a number of ways and some of the victims, they don't even know the people who are uploading these images online. So that was the second reason. The third reason is that the term revenge porn defines the conduct from a, pe a perpetrator's perspective because it, 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 it centers perpetrators. It centers their motivations on why they have conducted this, they, they've carried out this act in the, in the first place. And doing so, it, it ignores the varied experiences of the victims and the harms that they have suffered. It actually minimizes like those kind of, uh, of, of harms it oversimplifies what is a very complex matter. And lastly, the term revenge pornography, it, it, it likens this image to pornography. This is not pornography. These images were not created for sexual in, in entertainment at all. It could have been a, a person just taking their own photo, like just appreciating their own body, storing them on their phone. They lose the phone, someone steals the, the phone, and the next thing, it's all out there in Pornhub and in all these other places you can imagine. So the term is very misleading. Why it is important that we speak about this issue is that because if such a flawed understanding of what this issue is about make it into law, then we have a problem because we are going to have a legislative intervention that addresses something mm. that isn't there, that doesn't speak to the realities of the, of the victims. And it is very important that we have pieces of legislation that speaks to the needs of the victims that also addresses the harm that they have suffered. And that's all for now that I, I can say, but there are many reasons why we cannot, we should never use the term revenge porn. And that is why uh, a lot of people have come up with uh, alternatives like image-based uh, abuse. And that's because a, a word like that, there are many others. It, um, it uses um, mm. inclusive language. It allows for various descriptions and conceptualizations of what is it that is happening. It's also wide enough and 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 enables us to think about the, the the nature and the many ways in which victims are harmed and who are they are they perpetrators. It it makes us to 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 imagine to really explore the issue. It's not limiting, and revenge porn is very limiting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michelle, did you have a follow up on that? 
Yeah, sorry, I didn't find the microphone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> revenge, this word uh, gives us the idea that the victim did something wrong, and this is the reaction, uh, and put the victims in this position that they're usually um, are put in, that it's, oh, you must have do something, uh, or this is your fault because uh, you sent this image. Mm -hmm. um, pornography by <clears throat> also is usually has a negative um, or obscene connotation, and we have we have to stop demonizing different sexual expression. There's nothing wrong with sharing intimate image in a context of. Um, <clears throat> of uh, trust with your partner or I don't know, with your friends, uh, whatever someone uh, can want to uh, share their image. And and the, the other thing is that in pornography, in like in the business of pornography, there is constant. And here the concept is to share your image with your partner or your friends, but there's not a concept to be shared on the web um, or with people that you don't know. And this is the problem uh, that when you talk about pornography there, you put again the victim in this position, like you take the risk, you consent with uh, making this video or this picture. So now you have to 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 take um <clears throat> to take the responsibility on it it's it's the risk and you knew it and <clears throat> and that again um it's a uh it, it affects everyone because if we put the victims in this position that means that no one of us can uh have a, like free expression of our sexuality and we have to like to, to change the subject from the demonizing the victim uh, to the other side, that it's the, the person that shared this image without the consent of the victim. But as researchers and other academics, we, we, we should try to raise awareness about the use of language, but also understand uh, that public, uh, that it's not engaged with these uh, researching issues. Uh, the, porn revern the term revenge porn, it's, so much easier to say like it's uh it's shorter and so we 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 have to to understand even if we had to talk about the in the meaning and the importance of language we also have uh to to understand and not criticize and, uh, and every person that may uh use these words that there's no always like a, a bad intention with the using of the word it's just that they, they're shorter words and that's why i think uh most people speak about porn revenge yeah i mean it's a, it's a lot of words but actually it's you you've raised you both raised interesting points and I, i'm going to turn to well anyway i'm going to let whoever wants to answer this question answer it but we're not really just talking about the distribution of an image of your of, of a self-produced image right it's a broader category as well right grace you can jump in or no conflict it's up to you jump in <laughs> um, absolutely um the, we are living in the era where there are a lot of um, some people call them deep fakes um, you know where um, technologies used to um, to make uh, images of people representations of people we are also living in an era where you know um, not all content um, is a um, is produced in, um, in, in in a straightforward way, like, you know, uh, that people went and took uh, uh, pictures or made videos of themselves. There's also, you know, all these people who hack into other people's spaces. Um, I have um, witnessed, for example, WhatsApp groups where people uh, go online and harvest images of, um, of it's mostly women but harvest images of people and then share them uh, so people could be sharing uh, images for example in closed groups uh, where you know more private matters are being discussed but then these images find their way into whatsapp groups where uh, the 
the subject is completely different from what was being discussed in the in in the previous group so sometimes you find that maybe somebody shared their their image in um in an educational setting or in a setting where they were creating awareness on an issue but then these images are taken to a different setting where the discussion is uh, completely um uh, different so um that um calls on people who are researching and uh, the public at large um, to expand our view on, 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 on these issues of um, that their images online, but they were shared in a non-consensual manner. It's, it's not only um, uh, in cases where there was, um, you know, intimacy or a, a relationship so let's not limit it to what it was when maybe the term revenge porn came, but also be aware of the world we live in and um, all these ways that exist of uh, producing content. Yeah, yeah. And then Franca, did you, did you want to have a follow up on that? I, I think uh, Grace has, has covered um, a, a lot of issues. I, I think one thing I can add is that when AI is used a, a lot of times, um, these images, they look real, they are convincing when my, my image, my face has been imposed on a, let's say a, a pornographic image, and it, it would look real, like I'm the only person who will know that actually that is not me. Any other person out mm. there who either knows me or not, they, they will think it's real, that, that it is me. Also, we also have situations where there, there are people who just uh, who who go out, out of their way to 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 record like people either in sometimes in public spaces or you could be in in your own flat and someone has got a hidden camera you know that records you mm. while you are naked or while you are involved in a sexual activity sometimes they broadcast all of those things online and this broadcasting of of these things also now has in, has evolved to include it, it, even rape where rape is being broadcasted mm. On online mm -hmm. and and people still mm -hmm. if, even when we share these things people will still like think that all oh, victims are responsible they are they are to blame a lot of times like someone doesn't know that this is something that is actual I don't know if there's any camera here or if there's anyone who's looking at me every time I'm, I'm in my bedroom how am I supposed to know I'm not, it's not like I know that much about technology and and all those things. And there's also, it, it also uh, comes as an act of uh, doxing, right? And, and and this is a situation where your your naked um, image or, or video is, is accompanied by your personal details. So basically your name, surname, where you work, where your, your address, right? And it will be linked to your social media profile. I know, for example, one of the first uh, survivor of this, of, of this crime here in South Africa, I think it was around 2008, she woke up one day with men knocking on her door because uh, her images had been online, the physical address was there. And the ex-boyfriend in this particular case, who had been a fiance, had written that um, uh, that whoever wants some kind of services must come to this woman, right? And and that really compounds the some of the consequences that you saw because it affects your physical safety. For most of that year, she really was dealing with strangers coming in to buy the services and all those things. So I think the most important thing to say that is um, non-consensual sharing of intimate images takes many forms and the images are obtained in, in, in various ways. Thank you. Mm, thank you. This is such a tough topic actually. Um, 
there's so many things I want to unpack, but actually what I want to do is I want to give each of you an opportunity to talk about the legal landscape in your countries, because I think actually, you know, we're, we're getting at a, a, a critical issue, which is how we, how we address this and how, how, how victims or people who've had this happen, how they address it. So, um, Michelle, can I turn to you? Uh, so give, give us a, a brief landscape of like what, you know, what the, what, what the legal landscape is in Chile. And, and then also um, like tell us like what's informing some of the laws that are coming forward for that. Okay, so yeah, um, of course. In Chile, we don't have a law that um, penalize um, directly the distribution of intimate image without the consent of the victim. And so, what we can, the only thing we can do is to try to to use other laws that are not meant to this kind of situation, but that can help, for example, the intellectual property law, um, or the there's uh, there's other law that for the when you take image from someone but without their consent um, or also um, when you oh <laughs> sorry my English it's for me um, when you um, um, mm -mm. when you what well, yeah when you treat some someone and you ask her uh to, to do stuff uh because you have image from this person for example but the problem is that if the image were taken by you the only thing that you can do is to 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 tell that you have uh intellectual property on this image but you can try to use the other law that um are meant to for uh um that are in the um, federal legislation, because these laws are only for uh, cases that the victim, uh, the, the image were taken without the consent of the victim, but it's the image were taken, not the distribution. So uh, this makes me think that there's um, a problem in the background of the law that show you what is the conservative um yeah there's there's a conservative intention in, in the law that again we put again the victim in the same position that if you take your image then you have uh, to know that there's some risk and if this happened it's your fault um even if we have but we have a uh, human rights uh, treaties uh, that um, make us um, that uh, we we have signed a lot of uh, human rights treaties that we we need to make us uh, to be um, in the position that we have to make new law, but we haven't do anything. Like we have. Uh, law projects that are, are uh, four years old and they're just don't move like it's something that it it uh apparently it's not something that it's from real interest for our congress so that's something really um disturbing about the situation in chile how that compare or tell me tell us about kenya <laughs> um so some of the things uh, to note about kenya is that um, in 2018 uh, a law called the computer um, misuse and cyber crimes act was passed and um, this law does not specifically provide for the offense of um, non-consensual distribution of intimate images. 
Um, however, there are some provisions in the law that uh, could be useful for victims or survivors of, of uh, this crime. Um, for example, the law talks about um, uh, wrong, uh, cyber harassment, that is the first one. Then it also talks about wrongful distribution of obscene or intimate images. Um, it also talks about false publication. In fact, this law is known in some circles as the fake law, I mean fake news um, law, because um, it has two offenses related to fake news. One is false uh, publication, and then the other one is a publication of false information. Um, the thing about the law in general, uh, just like in uh, Michelle was explaining, is the uh, moralization of issues. Um, so this law, um, um, uh, what is it called, criminalizes uh, pornography or obscene or intimate images in all their forms. Yeah, and you see even the word being used there is obscene uh, in all their forms. It does not matter whether they were taken with consent or without consent. Um, and so the effect of that could be that um, uh, the victims whose um, images are distributed um, could be could fear going to report these cases because um, they could also be caught up by the same law, which um, you know, which um, criminalizes any sharing of uh, uh, intimate images, um, and so that is the most problematic thing about it. Um, on to the second question of uh, what informed this law, it's uh, quite interesting in the Kenyan case. Uh, the first thing is that this law was made uh, right after the 2017 elections. And so um, if you know anything about Kenyan elections is that they are always quite contested. And um, we use a lot of uh, online uh, uh, for campaigning. And so what happened is that um, as soon as the election was over, the parliamentarians were very, very keen on um, doing something about fake news, so to speak. So that was a big influence. And then um, another thing that was influential was religion, uh, because, um, you know, in the election during the campaigning period, um, there was a lot of um, reliance on uh, religious bodies. And so once they got to parliament and they were making a law, um, there, there was um, still memory of um, the platform they had used to get it to parliament. And so you find that uh, even as they were debating the law, there was a lot of um, uh, framing of issues such as uh, pornography being a scene that is, um, you know, killing the youth or, or um, fraying the moral fabric of, of Kenyan youth and how Kenyan youth are getting lost to pornography and so on and so forth. And so you find that it was so interesting that there were members of parliament who had been victims of non-consensual distribution of images, but um, the tool they decided to use or their legal response was to criminalize it all um, and uh, not to think about um, that, that sexual image, images could be taken uh, for education or in um, between consenting adults or something like that. No, their um, view was that um, everything should be criminalized. Um, the last thing I'd say about the state of the Kenyan law is that um, other than this criminal law, uh, people have relied on um, civil law. People have uh, previously sued uh, for uh, distribution of their images and they have used um, the right to privacy and they have been successful, which is um, something positive about the judicial interpretation of um, uh, the right to privacy. I have so many follow-up questions, but no, Kankula, I'd like to turn to you now on the legal, and then we'll dive into these <laughs> all the challenges. Okay. Yes, I, I think with regard to South Africa, the, the first thing to mention is that uh, our, our constitution does provide some kind of legal protections for victims of this crime. Basically, it helps it upholds everyone's right to, to, to dignity, privacy, freedom of sexual expression, and all those things. But when it comes to the law itself, the most important thing to say is that we are close. We, 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 are, we are just so close. 
and and because our, our law our legal like landscape has been going through some changes i will say maybe dating back as as, as far as um 2015 and 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 it's still going through those kind of um of, of those changes because currently parliament right now is making amendments to the domestic violence act and these changes basically they 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 embrace the the fact that uh technology is increasingly being used to 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 commit domestic violence it speaks to the online harm so they, they, they it, it embraces all the the new developments that uh, come with the use of technology which i think is is is, a, is, a, is an amazing is an amazing thing and one of the things that it does is that obviously it places some legal or obligations on internet uh, intermediaries like for example they 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 do have the now they, they will be obliged for example to 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 uh, to assist the, the the police with the with, with the investigations they will be um now obliged to provide the courts even with the details of some of the perpetrators because many of you would know that would know how difficult it is to even get that kind of information from all these from your social media companies and without that information it's even difficult to to open a case in court because you you even though you may have an idea that maybe my ex did this kind of thing but without that sentence really it, it is not helpful but despite what everything that i've said one thing i mentioned is that we are very close so what has happened is that um we now have the the cyber crimes act which was recently signed into law in 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 may and basically that act is the primary law that will deal with all crimes that are committed online and what it does is that it makes it a criminal offense to publish someone's intimate images uh, without their consent the image could be real or simulated well there is that nudity requirement but if there is information in the image that identifies you and that injures your human dignity your your right to, to to sexual expression and all those things you could be prosecuted for that so for for, for it's the it's one of those amazing developments so once this act, so one of the challenges we have is that the act has been signed into law, but it will only come into effect on the date uh, that will be proclaimed by the president. So he signed the act in May. So we are waiting, right? And until he's, he pro he makes that kind of a proclamation, basically, it it it, it is it is it's currently it's not an act that victims of these crimes can use for now. Besides the Cyber Crimes Act, we also have the, the Film and Publications Amendment Act. And that act was signed into law, I think last year, December. It also makes it an offense to distribute other people's uh, intimate images and videos without their consent. And that act really basically, um, it, it speaks to the protection of um, of children against um the exposure to like child pornography but it does contain the the offense of uh, it does address the issue of non-consensual distribution of intimate um, images and there have always been questions about whether the offense should have been included in that act as well when it's already in the cyber crimes act and and and, and some of the concerns was whether this would not um a, a, like confuse the police as, as as well as the judicial officers because now they will have to think which act we have to use and all that stuff but there is consensus among civil society organizations that the primary act for dealing with cyber crimes and uh, the non-consensual distribution of intimate images will be the cyber crimes act that act too has not yet come into effect it is it is waiting for the finalization of the regulation. So everything is all good. It's on paper. We are all saying we are close, but un until those two acts, I'll say, uh, become effective, they cannot be used by any victim. So for now, victims can only make use of existing legal remedies and they have done so. For example, they have used the domestic violence act 
and others have they have just like in Kenya they have been suing for um, for damages uh, defamation claiming that there has been an injury to their human dignity and and all those things and our courts really have been making a really what I would say um, beautiful orders those kind of orders that you you you, you want to see where they have ordered the perpetrators for example to hand over firstly they acknowledge that this is an act of gender-based violence and that the violence act need to get to give victims maximum protection even for crimes that are committed online and they have given the orders where they will order the the perpetrator to hand over all their digital devices so they could so in case there are still images those can be deleted and they and the perpetrator will have to hand over a, an affidavit confirming that they have actually deleted all the images and, and to the best of their ability, even online. Some of the orders really have been about um, giving anonymity to victims. And you will all know that this is something that is very important because a lot of victims um, are scared of bringing um, what their cases to the courts because they don't want to for publicity <laughs> to to be shown into their cases because then then they become um the, the, the victims that are known all over the place and then that shines the light even on their images and all those things so it has been great really to see our courts issuing those kinds of um those kinds of of orders where victims can be provided with anonymity there's also the 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 pre, uh, the prevention from harassment so that's an act that mostly uh, deals with cyber harassment but uh it was passed in 2011 i haven't heard anything about it i don't know if people know about it sometimes there are times when i feel like no one knows about this act but it, it is there it, it can be used and it has really a very cheap remedy where if you feel that you have been uh, harassed online you can go to the nearby court and seek for a protection order against the person who is harassing you online both online and and and, and offline so the current state is that we do have uh, laws that criminalizes this conduct but they are not yet uh, effective so they cannot be used so as a result you have to use civil remedies, uh, reports to the police for crimin in Yura, and 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 in, in all honestly, most of the reports that I've heard, that I've read, it's like victims saying, "Oh, I went to the police to report the case," and and that's just the end. I don't know what happens to those kind of cases, and obviously, people have sued for damages and all those things, and using the Domestic Violence Act. So we are waiting. We, we are close. We, we really are getting there. Yeah. So I'm curious what you think about the criminalization of this, because you can see a, a, a situation where there could be some state overreach or um, or some of these laws could be abused in the other way. Or, for instance, as Grace was pointing out in, in Kenya, the way that consensual and non-consensual um, sexual images are criminalized. And I'm, I'm just curious what you think about that tension between the criminalization and say arguments for free expression and where the state could be overstepping and you know in, in in this in the case of south africa for instance you know right now you have a democratic government you have you know this really strong and vibrant constitution i mean actually in in, in all the countries but when is it like so what's your opinion on that that tension between um uh, free expression and criminalization of these acts and where you think there could be uh, some tensions around that. Um, can I can I turn to you, Michelle? Do you feel uh, good to answer that? Or anyone and just jump in. <laughs> We're having a conversation. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, I, I can come in. I, I am all for criminalization right because most of the literature that i have raised uh, that i have read basically they, they, they do say that a criminal law is um it, it, it serves a symbolic um purpose it basically says to everyone that this is unacceptable behavior that the, it recog it acknowledges the harm that has happened to the to the victims and 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 more and and, and more than anything um 
it 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 has that deterrent of some sort because it's it's now a criminal offense and and some of the perpetrators well i guess if they're not south african they, some are, are really scared of going to jail but we do know that there are those who well i mean if 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 you, if you look at um issues around sexual assault i mean the way they all can you're like thinking but there are lost people are going to jail and but so there are those kind of victims who really it, it seems to me aren't really scared of jail so i i support cri criminalization to their effect right and i'm also someone who who believes that um it, it is possible to to to, to strike a, a a balance of some sort because no right is absolute right so you 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 can't be uh, you can't give people a space and a, and a platform to 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 shame and and injure the dignity of of, of other people on the grounds that they they are actually expressing the, the, their rights no one has got that kind of a right so what is important is for a piece of legislation to be carefully crafted to such an extent that it deals with the with the unacceptable behavior and doesn't capture all the other innocent acti activities i know for example in the us uh, there are states that have been able like really to craft those kinds of, of laws that don't uh, injure the first amendment and all those things it, it, it's possible it's something that can be done but I, I i believe that no rights is is absolute and we do have a responsibility to to really protect the victims and survivors out there but having said mm. the, that i do acknowledge that um while uh, criminalization is important it it it, it, it um it, it, it can't be treated in isolation. You do need other mechanisms that go beyond criminalization, right? You you mm -hmm. you do need to to really think about what motivates. Why do we have this kind of a problem? And some of us we do know that it's rooted in in patriarchy the society's obsession with the women body like the scrutiny mm -hmm. that is on the women body and um and and, and that obsession with going after women who are able to sexually express themselves and 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 all, all of this is is just a continuum of sexual based uh, gender based violence sexual violence and, and 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 all those things and and so we we do need to find ways of 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 dealing, like really with, with the with the with the violence culture that is in our society, with how people view and and see women, and, and for that you need to change culture, you need to change people's mindset. So that's why you need to have some educational like programs of 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 some sort. You need to. Um, obviously uh because all of us it's like we woke up one day it's like oh everyone has got a phone a lot of us are still learning right and um and all of us were a lot of us were just happy with the advent of of the internet and all those things so it it, it, it does somehow make sense that we all have these kinds of um of, of challenges and all those things but it, while criminalization can resolve these kind of things, we also need to to deal with this thing, with this new thing that is coming with the with with the use of the phone, the easily availability of the phone, and all those things. And and the law by itself will not deal with all these issues. You need something beyond criminal law. But I I, I am all for criminalization. Mm. I want to talk about the the non legal mechanisms, but first I want to hear from Grace and Michelle if you have a follow up on that around the. Um, I do agree with uh, a lot of what uh, non non Tantler is saying. Um, I I think there is space for both. There is space for freedom of expression. But then when your freedom of expression is um, affecting other people's dignity, then or when your freedom of expression involves um, taking other people's uh, uh, content without their consent, then that should be criminalized. Um, and I, it reminds me of uh, the experience here in Kenya with uh, gender-based violence or uh, what people like to say gender issues um it's a very power based thing um that you can you can have the criminal law it can be very clear on what the 
on what the process should be. But then you find that there are so many cultural barriers to reporting such crimes and to following up. And um, I, I think uh, my heart uh, leapt with joy when I heard about um, making um, making space for victims to be anonymous in the judicial process. Uh, I'd also want to point out that um, one of the cases that is featured in the um, in the paper when we talk uh, about Kenya uh, was um, a child um, whose uh, images had been taken, whose intimate images had been taken without her consent um, in the course of a criminal uh, um, uh, procedure. And um, the striking thing about that case is that it's a civil society organization that took up the case and went to court, um, which is ref reflects on um, a lot of the the, the people who get criminal justice uh, in Kenya, uh, especially when it's gender based, the role that civil society plays is quite uh, huge in um, you know helping them uh, navigate through the, the the whole system because it's not easy. We've we've had a lot of uh, cases where. Uh, people turn to traditional law or to customary law and they want the gender-based uh, uh, issues to be you know, resolved in, in, in the traditional space. Uh, and sometimes um, it works well, other times it's not very fair to the victim. And so um, the, we cannot uh, under, under, um, estimate the role of civil society also underestimate, let's not underestimate the role of education and, and awareness. Uh, because it's not just about uh, criminalizing the offense, it's also about uh, uh, making people know, you know, including all those people who have, for example, WhatsApp groups um, where they meet in the evening to view uh, um, women's bodies or whatever, to make them know that, um, be careful, uh, do not... Um, do not be distributing um, uh, uh, images or videos without um, without the consent of whoever you're viewing. This could uh, catch up with you, uh, and, and you could spend some time in jail. So, to that extent, it will act as a deterrent. And uh, you know, having a criminal law is also important uh, in that um, the victims know that there is a space they can turn to. But on the other hand, um, it's only one part of a bigger uh, uh, piece and um, all the other parts, including awareness, including education, including having uh, civil society organizations that can help victims are equally important. I'm just uh, seeing the messages on yeah. the slide here, but Michelle, yeah, please go ahead, say something. <laughs> and no, also yeah, I should say uh, that if there's say... audience questions, please put them in. Go ahead, sorry, Michelle. No, I, I, just, I just want to say that I totally agree with uh, what has been said that this would not be the first case of coalition of rights in which we have to make some balance between different rights but for the same reason it's so important to stop demonizing the different sexual expression and protect the rights to the person of to live their sexuality on their uh, own ways uh, or otherwise what happens is that a, a right that we usually protect very strongly as the freedom of expression because it, it's indispensable for our democracies it can easily be put above the right of the victims uh, of their sexual uh, expression so um, this requires not only a change of the law but a change of mentality of how we educate citizens from the schools onwards uh, education of public uh, officials or, or persons that are in charge to receive the the denounce or the complaints of of people that uh, are victims because what also happens is that uh someone sometimes when when we we go to to the judge or to the uh, to the police or i don't know to the public officials that are in charge to receive um they they just don't understand the law or they don't know the law or they re, re victimize the victims so this it's not something only about the change of the law but the change of mentality so we can all be able to make that balance because uh between uh 
rights that are in uh, in collision sometimes. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to take some of the audience questions and I've been encouraged to um, inc let, have people ask their questions. Um, and I'm, I'm reading the GDoc as we're doing this, so forgive me for my multitasking, but actually some of the things I'm assessing from that are, um, what are some of the like non-legal mechanisms for dealing with this? Like you've raised it, you know, you've, you've all talked about like education, but what are some other, other ways that um, outside of the legal system, because it is speaking to kind of some normative ideas in society or some moralizing ideas about women's bodies or how we should behave. So I'm, I'm curious what you think are maybe outside just like, because education is such a broad category. Like what are some of the things you, you think could be, can be done outside of the law to address this, like how we get at those change, the, the deeper changes and how we view each other and women's bodies or people's bodies. Someone jump in <laughs> or I'm gonna call on you, <laughs> Grace. <laughs> um, I, I was, I was uh, reading something uh, by APC. APC is a civil society organization um, that has a lot of members in Africa and they were talking about a uh, feminist internet and the feminist internet principles and um, when I shared it with uh, someone where, you know talking about the internet as a space where people can get sexual education and positive sexual education including children um, to get education to help them in developing their identity and um, it was shocking for a lot of people uh, because we have uh, become or our um, space has been closed up so much to, to think that um, uh, you know some things are sinful or immoral or um, whatever so um, the, you know sometimes we talk about education and um, it's it's uh, like you said it's such a wide thing there's still so much uh, to be explored and we have to educate ourselves um so much so especially in this age when um uh, there's so much uh, content available uh, on the internet so um we cannot um we cannot ever ever underestimate the role of education and then uh, still going back to the law um one thing, um, one thing uh, we've come to realize, especially with uh, working with the law and policy, is that the law is not this isolated thing that uh, works uh, in a silo. That um, even um, a well-crafted, even the best-crafted law, even if we had, for example, in the Kenyan law, even if we had uh, criminalization of uh, non-consensual um, yeah, images, it would still not be enough, um, even if um, even if this was, you know, like a law that was prioritized, because we still have to think about all the other barriers that exist to uh, accessing that law or accessing justice uh, through the law. And so um, it, it has to, we have to um, go beyond the law and also not assume that we can also do those other things and forget the law. We have to think of this as a, as a holistic uh, problem that affects us in society and so think of um, holistic ways of approaching uh, the problem so um, we have the law working hand in hand with um, educating people working hand in hand with um, even talking to younger children and uh, making them know that um, there's something like positive um, education and there's also like negative uh, education we have to look at uh, issues of power uh, because it's also uh, 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 um, it relates a lot with power and uh, how more powerful people are more likely to get away and so that uh, even as we are looking at the law we protect uh, the weaker parties and weaker groups and um, and, and 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 weaker uh, uh, victims we could also look at collective action, which I find um, uh, to be quite um, uh, an important tool that, for example, when um, you know, non-consensual um, images are distributed online, you have a group of people who come and say, no, this is wrong. Please take it down. Uh, please prosecute this person. Uh, and 
in that moment you have a lot of education going on you have a lot of uh, debate going on which raises awareness on the issues and 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 even makes people who um, are not aware uh, become aware and 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 so i think that is uh, one other um, uh, space where we have to uh, learn about these things and um, finally also to say that um, we should also uh, learn from you know our culture and environment and even the the, the traditional systems that exist because uh, previously there were always these spaces where people uh, could learn um, could have uh, sexual education but in enclosed spaces which i think has moved to also online um, you have closed facebook groups where people have um, uh, discussions on very intimate issues the problem becomes when uh, those discussions are taken outside spaces they were not uh, uh, meant to which would not happen in the um, in the offline world uh, because you know it was in a physical um, enclosed space and so if we tell people that uh, or if we educate people um, with um, with these analogies that uh, look we are talking about very intimate things but we are also talking about them in a safe space so um, this should not go outside um, that space that could also be um, useful analogy in, in 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 educating people about these issues mm -hmm. Michelle, do you have a follow-up on that you're on mute yes. you're on mute yeah there you go <laughs> Oh. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. No, I was saying I like the, the point that it's Grace. Am I muted still? No, you're good. I'm good. Okay, okay. So Grace raised the issue about uh, bystanders. Uh, I think those are the people we really need to to appeal themselves because and a lot of the photos or the images and videos get um, go viral because people just participate in 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 this thing. People they will reshare without really thinking about the the impact that that resharing thing ha has on 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 the victim. So those are the people we need to speak to. And I, I know, for example, yesterday I was just reading and I came across an an, an app. I think uh, I'll, I'll find out the name, but basically what 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 what, what it's doing is that uh, it is creating um, a group of bystanders who are conscious about these issues and who are the friends of the victims. So every time there is such images go viral, those are the people will come either to report. The, the images uh, to, to to internet online in, in intermediaries and or, or to give support or to speak out and and I think we really do need to to create um, a community of people that are really conscious that really understand the impact and the harm that um, non-consensual distribution of intimate images have on the people it's difficult for me really to think outside of education because the the, the the core of the matter is that a, a lot of people that there, there's still a lot of people out there who think that um th this is not really a, a, a matter it's something that you can snap out of like you can get offline you you know the issue will will, will go mm. they never really think that once your images are out there with your details and you are they are such they come through search engines that basically you become what google says that you are and that makes it impossible mm. for you to even find jobs to even enter into relationship so th so th there's a lot of like lack of understanding about the impact of this crime so i can't think outside of education is just it is is just so difficult for me but there, there are initiatives that i have seen which i've liked uh, unfortunately a lot of them they come after the effect for example i have been uh, impressed with the role of some legal firms here in south africa there are not that many but i know of this one law firm that provides uh, pro bono legal services to the to the victims they help you like 
all the way because it, it, this is not an, an, an easy issue that's something that someone can really deal with by themselves. So I, I like that. I also saw another law firm recently that um, released a, a digital like toolkit that speaks to that provides a lot of resources trying to explain all these terms and 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 where someone can go for support services and all those things and i think those are the kind of things that um we should also be talking about because there are so many role players uh, that are involved besides the users i mean uh, grace talk about civil society we, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to social media companies like um what are their policies on, 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 on these issues? How effective are they? We know a, a lot of these social media companies, they, they do have like policies. They, they do use AI to remove some of the images because for a, for, for a victim, one thing they want is for the images to go to get offline, they want to stop redistribution, but they need uh, a, a response that, that filters, that, that, that makes sure that even before it, it gets uploaded, AI is able to, to, to really pick that up so that it doesn't, but what we have now is that like the image is out there, then you can report and all those things. And for me, it, 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 it does say that we really need to have a, a real conversations with uh, a lot of this communication service providers broadly defined all of them we we need them to put um in place mechanisms that are victim focused that um that, that are fast especially when it comes to the removal of of, of the of the images and then there is the school the school curriculum i know there's a, a lot of work that um there is um, involved in trying to, I mean, I'll say here in South Africa, and, and it's the initiative of civil society organizations, and, and I know organizations like Google as well, where they, they really are um, like looking at prevention um, mechanisms of some sort. And, and, and part of that is having online safety programs like for, for the kids where they 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 um they really understand uh, how the internet works how they they that they understand that there are privacy settings settings that someone can use at least to have that uh, control over who posts what on their walls and, and and all those things and 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 for me these are things that are very important because it has got to start at, um, at a school level and it has got to be part of the education program the school curriculum needs to speak um to these kind of to these kinds of issues but honestly outside of these um outside of education awareness and stuff i i can't think of anything because for me it, it's the first step it's a prevention measure we always say that prevention is better than cure and i think we really do need to focus our energies on, on 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 prevention and then and then then to deal with what the law is saying and how we can uh, support victims really important points and um, we're, we're we're at the end of our time but actually i've been given permission to go over a little bit because we had an, a question um, about sexist interpretations of legal concepts and i'm going to turn it to, over to michelle and then after that we're going to have to close out unfortunately because it's such a good discussion and there's so much here but go ahead michelle okay so yeah um the question was um yeah when we have these legal concepts like honor, that can be really helpful when we have this collision between rights because it gives some um, space to the judge to, to make its decision. But it, it's, it's real that it, uh, it, it has on the other side the problem of the interpretation. And so if we carry with uh, conservative and sexist cultural burden, it's really possible that the judge can make a really uh, a hard decision or, for example, in Chile, we have recently a case uh, that I think it show really well how this works uh, of a girl that who commits suicide after his um, after being raped by his her boyfriend and the first judge in charge of deciding of the preventive uh, prison of the of the man that has also more than five complaints against him from different victims, consider that he was not dangerous 
to society and that in fact it was the victim who has reckless exposed herself to risk because she was drunk. She was minor, by, by the way. Um, and the decision was then appealed and reviewed by another younger judge who brought into the discussion an international treaty in the Inter-American Convention of the Prevention, Punishment and Eradication of Violence Against Women, and the Convention of Belen Dupara. And that uh, and he decided that the man was uh, dangerous for society. So for the, the time that uh, launched the investigation, he had to be in jail. Um, that shows us how important it is to educate are also a uh, human rights treaty, our international commitment to develop capacity building of judge, prosecutor and police to address cases of online gender violence because it happened a lot that they are not prepared so victims are re-victimized so they just feel that they are wasting their time um, <laughs> to go to the police and even there also happened that the police has access to the videos and then they start to share the videos between the police the the, the these the mates in the police station I, I don't know so we need to educate and it's it's really important um because society is changing but uh if we don't educate no not everyone gets into this change of mentality in the case that i i just uh comment the first judge it was an old man that grew in a, grew up in a society that where in Chile we have jokes uh, in t in TV about the rape of drunk woman that of course he will say that it was the fault of the victim and not of the of the man so I I think it's it's yeah it it uh, this kind of legal concepts give you. Um, a really um, broad uh, space for interpretation, and that's why it's really important, not just the law, but also to educate. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, honestly, I, I feel like we could carry on with there's I have myself so many follow up questions, but I, I know I'm being told that it, we have to close out now. So I, I want to thank you all for all of your, your work on this, for the work on the paper, and for this really rich discussion today. Um, it's a difficult topic, but um, I hope everyone watching um, enjoyed and enjoyed and in, in quotes the event. Um, so CG has recorded it. And if you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues, it'll be available on CG's YouTube channel. Um, and please subscribe to CG Online on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn um, to keep up to date. And then also, if you want to follow IDRC as well, International Development Research Center on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, if you go to our website, you can also subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all so much. And thank you, colleagues, for this good discussion. We have so much more to talk about. And um, yeah, have a great day. Yeah.